You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is October 4, 2013, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, air sampling for pollen and spores. Our presenter is Dr. Charles Barnes. He's the Director of Allergy Research at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. now joined by Dr. Charlie Barnes. Dr. Barnes is the Director of Allergy Research here at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics, and he's going to talk with us today about ear sampling for pollen and spores. Just, just to point out, every, every morning, I guess every evening, uh, on, the, now on the TV, the weather dude tells you what the pollen count is. The pollen count is this much ragweed and this much mold and, and so on, and m- most people in Kansas City really don't know where, where that comes from. Um, so the fact is it comes from here at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. Uh, and if you'd like to know about how that, <clears throat> how that is done, what the collecting method is, and how those counts are reported, um, well, that's what Dr. Barnes is about to tell us about. So welcome to Conferences Online Allergy, Dr. Barnes. Um, oh, button. You can have the keyboard and the, <laughs> the mouse. Move this a little closer. So we have it and, Take it away. <clears throat> okay. Um, these are our, according to our formula, our, our questions for the uh, uh, CME. Uh, so which of the following is commonly used to collect air samples for aeroallergen estimation? Uh, weather balloons, remote control aircraft, house dust, the Hearst spore trap, or spectrophotometer? Actually, the aircraft sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. Could we get one of those? I, I was thinking about that. I'd like that. Yeah. I have a picture of somebody actually who does that. But, uh, they're, they're actually, it's not. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then which of the following is a common aeroallergen in Kansas City? Oak, ragweed, elm, grass, or all of the above? And number three, which of the following mathematical manipulations is used to produce airborne pollen counts in pollen grains per cubic meter of air? Do you square the radius of the collector times 3.14 and divide by the speed of the fan. You divide the number of pollen grains collected in 24 hours by the volume of air sampled that day, and, or you multiply the number of pollen grains collected per minute times 60 minutes per hour times 24 hours per day, or all of the above. So we'll, okay. yeah, we might get an answer to those we later might, on here. We might not. Yeah. <laughs> okay, our objectives are to understand how air samples are taken for outdoor pollen and spore counts, and we'll talk a little about indoor counts also. Uh, to understand how air samples are taken for indoor spore counts and to review the major outdoor and indoor aeroallergens here in Kansas City. Um, so these are some of the collectors. Uh, the, basically we have three different types. We have our outdoor spore trap type collectors that have some sort of uh, vacuum device and a small slit that spores are pulled through and pollen is pulled through and they impact on a uh, generally a grease coated piece of plastic or in sometimes a grease coated slide uh, that moves with time and then we have uh, a rotor rod type device that uh, that can be set for time intervals and you see the little things at the bottom will spin and, and you collect you turn this on every so many so often, and you calculate how many pollen stick to the lucite rod that's here on the bottom that's also coated in grease. Do we still have that? Uh, we have the rotor rod device somewhere, although I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, it, we have moved uh, twice, and uh, I don't know if it got put in with the stuff that's stored in allergy or the stuff that's stored over here as part of uh, environmental. Oh, okay. But uh, I know uh, I saw it a few years ago. Okay. Okay. And then, then another uh, device that also uh, basically pulls a vacuum, brings in air through the top, and impacts on a slide uh, is much like a spore trap, but just not as complex. Uh, and so this is a, the basic uh, schematic of a Hearst spore trap. You can. Uh, Go get to here. You can see right here. This is just a clock mechanism that 
pulls a slide attached to a spring and there's a, a surround here and a place you can pull a vacuum in it and basically a small hole right here and so you pull a vacuum on the inside. Uh, air will flow through the hole at a rate depending on how big the hole is and then things that are too heavy, uh, things that are heavier and larger will come through the hole and go smacking into the slide and stick because the slide is covered with silicone grease or the uh, air in there and things that are too small and too light will actually go around the slide and eventually get pulled out. This is generally connected to uh, some sort of mechanism so that it has a wind, and a, a wind vane on it or a weather vane and Typically, these devices are structured so that they may be made to face the wind or face any incoming spores that are traveling on the wind all of the time. And that avoids the problem of differences in flow, basically, from when the unit is facing the wind and the wind is basically blowing into it, or the unit facing away from the wind when the wind is almost pulling things out of it. So if you're facing the wind all the time, you, you get around those problems. However, uh, unless the vacuum device is well controlled, you can actually get a higher flow rate anyway when the wind is blowing toward it than you do when the, uh, when the wind is not blowing. And so uh, those are some considerations that have to be made in the structure of the mechanism. But normally that's, that's not a, a big consideration. So that could make the pollen count seem higher when the wind blows. Right, it could make the pollen count seem higher when the wind blows. Volume, right? Yeah, because you're actually sampling a higher volume. Uh, it's right. really uh, important when the uh, vacuum fan or the device pulling a vacuum uh, has a limited capacity. And so if that, if that device is not operating at some sort of excess capacity, then uh, the load on it actually falls when the wind is blowing toward the unit and you get uh, speeded up. However, if it's operating properly, you're basically pulling a critical vacuum on the inside and so the force on the outside can be no greater than the uh, air pressure, which is like 14 pounds per square inch. Mm -hmm. And so uh, small changes should not affect it. But it, a lot has to do with the structure of the unit. Uh, this is a spore trap as manufactured by Burkhardt, which is what we have on the roof of the hospital. And you can see some of the features. This is the vacuum fan down here. And uh, it's a pretty good vacuum fan. Basically, it's just a series of tubes that uh, spin on a plate. And a vacuum is pulled in the center of the device here. And depending upon your seal here, the vacuum is good or bad, and so we've had to replace the seal before. Uh, if the uh, collector doesn't quite come up to specifications, and, and we check it about monthly to make sure that the uh, flow rate is within the limits that, that it should be. Uh, and then here on the front of the device is a small slit, and you can see access is had through the top of the device, so we can basically pull out the top of the device where our slide is mounted and we can either have a slide which is a 24-hour slide or a tape mounted on a wheel which will run for as long as seven days. And so this is a typical uh, collection what it will look like on a glass slide which uh, represents 24 hours. These things travel at uh, two millimeters per hour so for the 24-hour day, you get 48 millimeters of collection. Uh, it's obvious in Kansas City and, and where this slide was taken also, uh, this was changed in the morning. So this is morning rush hour. This is during the day. This is evening rush hour right here. And they don't run into the evening as long as we do. And then this would represent overnight when the collection would not be as heavy. Do, uh Collectors that are in rural areas have that same diurnal pattern when there's no traffic? Uh, when, there's, when there's no traffic, the pattern can vary depending upon how much dust is in the air. So if we're getting a, a really windy day, a really dusty day, uh, you can see more, more collection in the morning and less collection in the evening. But generally... You clearly see the two rush hour 
lines, though, and that probably occurs Monday through Friday. Right, close, and, and then not on Sunday. if you had one in Sunday. Wyoming where Brock is about to go, would you also see that, or would that not be? No, I don't think you would see that in Wyoming. So that's clearly car-related. Yeah, it's clearly car-related, and, and it can even be uh, on the weekends, if it's a cheap Sunday, we don't generally tend to see Really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> we tend to see a peak during the middle of the day sometimes. And, and you can tell how they did by how early the tire, it goes up again and <laughs> the people are leaving. I have a try. Yeah, that's probably possible. That would be an interesting study. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, that's the, the head, and, and it, it, uh, it's the 24-hour head. And it's mounted here in the top with a spring to kind of hold it in here. And there's a, a rubber gasket here that, that we have to keep uh, coated with uh, silicone to keep it uh, sealed that helps draw a vacuum in the middle of the unit. Uh, the slide itself can simply be mounted in a in the brass holder here. Uh, air comes in through the slit or orifice on the front of the unit. And actually the shapes of these orifices are pretty well engineered to make sure that the maximum number of particles will impact here on the glass slide. Now these things do have efficiencies at various sizes and so uh, these are manufactured so that the greatest efficiencies are in the range of most pollen which is around 10 to 30 microns and they even stretch down into the 5 micron range and the efficiency stays about 90 percent but when you start to get particles smaller than uh, then five microns, and especially when you get into the two micron range and less, and there are some small spores, some small ascospores, some aspergillus and penicillium spores that are less than two microns, uh, efficiency can fall to as low as 50 percent. And we normally don't uh, calculate uh, back in for efficiency, but it is something you, you have to worry about with collectors. The Burkhart collector is one of the best for efficiency for really small particles. And you can see the air will flow in here. This would be mounted right here on the front. Air is going to come through here in a stream, impact a line on the collector, and gradually the collector will move down or actually move up uh, during the day, and you get collections throughout the day. Uh, this is the round collecting head here. And we'll put a piece of plastic tape on this, and uh, the collector will move in front of the orifice throughout a period of seven days. Uh, they are, it's basically driven by a clock that's mounted in the middle of this. Uh, now, this is how you change the slide. Basically, the slide just slips in, and just like a cake, the frosted side goes on the top uh, for these, and it moves from the top away from the orifice so that time moves away from the frosted edge on this type of collector. <coughs> the clock is, is wound and uh, it wasn't a problem. I mean, this, is, this is the height of 1950s technology and uh, at that time lots of people knew how to wind the clock and, and uh, winding the clock wasn't a problem. Uh, these days, very few people know how to wind a clock, uh, and, and overwinding the clock has been a problem for us. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so basically, we only uh, we only wind the clock once a week on a particular day and a certain number of windings to uh, to maintain the uh, the spring and not overwind the clock or not let it get down and not uh, operate. Uh, and you. These are nice thing about the plastic drums. I mean, the uh, round collectors especially is that they can be coated and transported and just simply change one out for the other. And this is what we do during the winter time when uh, you really can't get out on the roof every day. Sometimes the weather's bad. Sometimes it's icy. Uh, we try to keep it going. Uh, the clocks have gotten a little better over time for us, and and we have been able to keep it going going a few winters uh, all winter. Uh, but sometimes it, it just gets too bad and, and uh, you know, we get ice up there and the whole collecting unit freezes up. You know, if we get the whole unit iced up um, for a couple of days, we, we don't get any, any collection. But we can find, I can find some spores in the air 
um, during all times of the year. Now the concentrations during the winter time get really low and nothing really cleans the air quite as well as snow because right after a snow there's really not much out there in the air. But uh, especially the larger spores like Altineria and, and uh, things like that, we can find one or two. Uh, you know, you have to really search for them, but you can find them. That's why the air smells so clean after the snowstorm. Yeah, and so, you know, these, are, these things are just fitted on here by a by nut that's screwed onto the shaft, and the shaft is attached to the clock, and the clock turns. And so it's really a very simple mechanism. Um, you know, this is not such a simple mechanism, but there are lots of other air collectors. And this is a gentleman from Cornell who was collecting spores. Uh, the there was a lot of research grant money given out in the uh, 80s and 90s for tobacco research. And so there's a, a fungus that travels on the air up from Cuba every year that affects the tobacco plants. And he was uh, actually collecting this at different altitudes. And you'll notice he's got four different collectors here hanging under the wing of the aircraft. Uh, basically, this is, this is onto a slide. And so he's just got a cover here. At a certain altitude, he will open this cover, and the uh, spores are allowed to impact on the plate, and then he'll close the cover, move to a different altitude, and open this cover. And, and so anyway, there was a, a monitoring system for watching the fungus move up from uh, Cuba every year, and they then would uh, alert the farmers when the fungus was due in their fields, and they, so they would be able to spray a smaller amount of pesticide to uh, prevent the fungus. And uh, this program went on for many years and was very successful at preventing the fungus. But uh, with the demise of, of a lot of t tobacco research money, this, this program has kind of gone away. And, and the gentleman who ran this, Charlie Maine and, uh, and Dr. Shields, uh, are probably older and retired by now anyway. So there, there are several names that, that we, might, we should mention for alternative samplers. One is Lanzoni. Uh, Lanzoni makes a unit very much like the Burkhardt unit. Uh, it looks and functions very much like the Burkhardt unit, and whereas the Burkhardt unit comes out of Britain, the Lanzoni unit comes out of Italy. And so they, they, they work quite well. Uh, we just happen to have a Burkhardt unit. And then the Rotorod, which was uh, mostly manufactured in the United States, uh, are very successful for pollens. And, and uh, since they spin in a circle, they don't... Uh, they're, they're not affected by the wind that much. And so uh, they do a very good job collecting pollen uh, in windy conditions. However, uh, they are not quite as efficient for the smaller uh, spores as the Burkhardt unit is. And then uh, Allergenco. The Allergenco was used mostly for indoor collections, although it, we used it successfully for quite a few years for outdoor collections. And uh, they tend to be very robust units and, and very simple to operate. Uh, the rotor rod, basically, I, I looked for rotor rod on the internet. Uh, there are some units still for sale on eBay every now and then, but uh, I don't think anyone is actively manufacturing the rotor rod units right now. Um, and because the rotor rod was multi data, and then multi data was bought out by SDI, and now SDI has been bought out by another firm. It still produces the pollen daily pollen counts on pollen.com, and it's a website that you can go to and get estimates of what your pollen count will be for the next several days. Uh, the problem with the pollen estimate is that the pollen estimates are really only as good as the weather estimates, and the weather estimates sometimes are not that good for the several two or three days. And so if the weather estimate is off 10%, the pollen estimate can be off 100%. And so um, it, it is a, a site you can go to and get estimates of the weather. I noticed that they said today our pollen count in, in Kansas City would be minimum or low. And actually, today our pollen count in Kansas City is quite high because we have a really strong weather front moving through and lots of windy conditions today. Hmm. Um, so this is the, the rotor rod device. And basically, it is some sort of timer mechanism. And you can set these using the dip switches to come on once a day or, or once every hour or however you want to. And at that time, the rods will start to spin. And the rod spins. And as it spins, it sweeps through a certain volume of air. 
and this volume of air can be calculated, and so you can calculate the volume of air, you can calculate the time, and you can look at the rods by dismounting them from the collector, collecting arm here, and putting them on to a mount and taking your microscope and, and just going right down the, the rod and counting the number of pollen you see. And so you can come up with an estimate of the total number of pollen collected. You can come up with an estimate of the total amount of volume of air collected and divide the pollen by the air collected and display the uh, pollen count in pollen grains per cubic meter of air. And so that's really all you have to do uh, to do the math on this. You just want to estimate the volume of air you collected. You want to estimate the number of total pollen you collected and divide the two uh, per and display it as per cubic meter of air. Uh, the, uh, the rotor rod also has a retracting uh, feature on some of the units so that the rod, when it's not uh, actively spinning, the rod actually retracts into the arm here. And that, that protects it from rain and, and things like that. Uh, and so this is an example of a rotor rod unit that's turned upside down. Normally you mount it so that the, uh, the arms are underneath uh, to protect it from rain. And uh, this is spinning around and, and uh, it's collecting pollen, or in this case I think collecting large spores. Okay, and, and uh, so you know, people did uh, research on these units to, to show how good they were. And basically both instruments appear to record the same relative changes in airborne particle concentrations. The Burkhardt appears to be superior for sampling particles less than 10 microns. And so that's, uh, that is a, a element that has gotten into the uh, allergy lexicon. And so uh, it's not unusual for that to be a, a question uh, on an allergy examination somewhere. And the answer is that the Burkhardt is better or the spore trap type device is better for collecting smaller particles, less than 10 microns. But for larger particles, the rotor rod device seems to be equally as good. Um, the Allergenco uh, collector that we saw earlier uh, was purchased by EMS Sales, and they still sell uh, some version of it. It basically now has morphed into from uh, this device, which was a, a very handy device where you mounted a slide on this little rotating sled, on this little sled here, and you close the top. It had a motor that was powerful enough to draw a critical vacuum in there, so uh, adjusting the vacuum was not difficult to do and, and something you didn't have to do very often. These were very handy. They would basically take uh, up to 24 samples and the timer could be changed to collect a uh, sample every hour for 24 hours or every minute for 24 minutes. Uh, or, you know, one hour and then stay off for a day and then come on another hour and stay off for a day or one sample a day for 24 days. And so uh, it was a very flexible and functional unit. We have several of these and, and we have used them for several studies. Uh, as far as I can tell, the new units are no longer available. Uh, the older units are available, and we have been able to get them serviced uh, through EMS sales. And so uh, I don't know if they're going to continue that or not, but they, these are very, uh, generally very good units. Uh, and they come with a, a battery and a power pack, and, and they were designed so that you can actually take this uh, lead right here and hook it right up to a car battery, you know, so you can, uh, I, I have somewhere an adapter that fits right into the, the cigarette lighter, uh, cigarette plug in of a car and uh, you put the unit right on top of the car and collect anywhere you want. Um, and we did some, some work with these and basically showed that uh, for all practical wind velocity, even though this, this unit is facing up and uh, not facing toward the wind, but for all practical wind velocities up to about 15 miles an hour or so, uh, they are essentially equivalent to the to the Burkhart unit. Now this unit has morphed into uh, a collector and this is a one-time, one-use only collector and uh, you can buy these readily from several 
many, many different outlets in Allergenco. And basically, they use the same architecture for the collecting orifice here that is on the other machine. And you can plug these onto a pump, and this is a, a Buck BioAir pump. Uh, often these are sold, uh, you know, at, in the same place where you buy the cassettes. And um, they can be used to collect uh, one sample at a time. And, and this, uh, these cassettes are numbered uh, from the factory, and so it's very convenient to, to collect this way. And uh, you, all you have to do is record the number in your sample log and cover them and then send them off to the laboratory. There's a small glass slide in the middle of this and the laboratory simply takes the unit apart and pulls the small glass slide out, puts it on a larger slide and looks at it under the microscope like you like you would in the rest of these. Uh, and this is a, the Buck BioAir unit. You can see the electronics has, has changed a lot and these units are uh, almost infinitely adjustable uh, to, to wherever take a sample, they're rechargeable, so the battery is contained in the unit, and, and so they're very practical to use, and that's what uh, we're using in most home inspections now. Okay, so we've now talked about collecting devices. Uh, let's go quickly over the the top pollens that we uh, that we have in Kansas City, and I have actually uh, altered this list a little bit from the last time I d I uh, did this talk two or three years ago. Uh, we still have lots of elm trees, and, and elm comes out early in Kansas City. Uh, if if things are warm, we can get elm by the you know, elm in the air around here at the end of January. And the same thing for maple. You know, if it's warm around here, we can get maple pollen in the air around January. But the cedar tree, the juniper, has actually moved into our area from the south, uh, and so it's almost an invasive species. And I think there are lots of functions in this. Some of them are, war you know, some of the functions are we, we're having warmer winters. Uh, another function is we, uh, since gasoline prices have gone up, we don't mow the sides of the roads like we used to. And the farmers don't mow their fields as often as they used to. And so uh, you'll notice that we see lots and lots of small cedar trees by the sides of the interstate. And basically these things can grow um, in places where it's really hard to reach with a mower to cut them down, and so you see them growing between two rocks and all kinds of, of areas on the side of the interstate. And so we're starting to see more juniper pollen. Uh, juniper pollen can actually be in the air uh, starting in November and going all the way through uh, to February or March until things start to get hot. Um, there are several uh, species of juniper around here, and and we ha we typically see juniper pollen uh, in late February, early March, uh, and it's related to a particular temperature, and, a, and and there has to be some moisture around, and so and and it they it actually spikes in the early morning, so you know about seven or eight o'clock in the morning on a nice cool but wet morning, we'll see a real spike in in juniper pollen. Um, and then, of course, we have a lot of oak in our area, uh, lots of oak trees. Basically, Kansas City, Missouri, where we where we are physically, uh, planted elm trees many years ago after the Dutch elm uh, disease came through and devastated the, the native elms. They uh, planted a resistant elm, uh, a paper elm that has the little uh, small paper discs for seeds. And uh, these elm trees grew uh, prolifically in this area and produced a lot of pollen and produced a lot of mess on the side of the road, too. And so Overland Park, which is a, a slightly newer city, said, well, we won't allow people to plant elm trees. We'll require them to plant oak trees. And so you, as soon as you cross the state line into Kansas, you see there are lots and lots of oak trees. And the oak trees also produce a lot of pollen. And they produce catkins, and the catkins get all over the uh, in the downspouts and, and roofs and things like that, and all over the cars. And so, uh, there you know, it doesn't matter what tree you've got; it's going to produce a mess some, at some point in its cycle. Uh, we also in Kansas and Missouri have a lot of mulberry trees. Uh, these are small pollen, and they are dye or triporate pollen. They have a characteristic look to them, but they also look a lot like 
some other trees that pollinate at the time that, that are sometime in the same family. Uh, mulberry uh, is mostly what we see in pollen, but also our uh, osage trees, our maclura trees, uh, pollinate at about the same time, and the pollen looks very similar, and they are in the, uh, in the same family, in the Morris family. Uh, and then those are our, our biggies for trees. Uh, then we generally start to see sorrel. This is a weed, uh, dock sorrel, uh, and then a grass, and our grasses, and all the grasses cross-react and look fairly similar, look very similar as far as the pollen goes. Then we had plantain, ragweed, and kinapod, and I've got individual pictures of those. Uh, this is an elm, a uh, beautiful big elm tree, and they tend to spread out to provide great shade. Uh, the pollen tends to be, uh, tends to have five pores, and it's situated around the equator. Do the new ones uh, have the big shade thing? Too? Yes, I mean, they're, they're, they're good. Right, they're, they're just as good. Uh, they are a lot messier tree, though. Mm -hmm. Probably one of the reasons they are resistant is because they have a very high pressure in the sap. If you cut a hole in them or something like that, sap comes oozing out. And so if you park your car under one of these trees, you're much, you're much more likely to have it dripped on by some of this very sugary sap. And so that's probably one of the reasons they are resistant to the, uh, to the Dutch elm disease. Uh, and then maple trees, uh, we have a lot of maples in our, our area, several different varieties. Uh, maples are triporate here, and they also have furrows. You can see the furrows, and, and oak will also have these three furrows, but the elm has a fairly characteristic look. They look a little plumper, and of course, elm is the tree that produces the very characteristic helicopters here that you can see. Uh, and then this is a, this is a cedar tree. Uh, this is a really good example of a fairly large cedar tree for our area. You, you know, they're moving into the area. They grow fairly slowly, and so you don't see a lot of really big cedar trees in the area, but this is a pretty good sized cedar tree. When it's pollinating, you can see uh, kind of yellowish, yellow-brown uh, pollen being produced. And if you walked over and hit this, you'd actually have a yellow cloud. It produces prolific pollen. And cedar is the Pac-Man pollen. You can see um, we actually treat these pollen when we, after we collect them. We put a stain on them uh, to make the pollen swell so the characteristic of the pollen will show. And in this stain, the cedar pollen will actually break out of the exterior, the exine of the pollen. The interior of the pollen will break out and be perfectly round, whereas the exine, the discarded hull, will be shaped like a Pac-Man. So that's a very characteristic shape. And, and it's like a pistachio. Yeah, like a pistachio. Very easy to spot. Uh, this is an, an oak tree. We have lots of oak in our region. We actually have 50-something different varieties of oak. Uh, mostly what was planted in Overland Park is pin oak. This is a white oak, I believe, and you can see this is, a, this is in the catkin stage. It's just starting to pollinate, so it produces these long, stringy things, and each one of these has a small flower on it, and each one of those flowers produces lots of pollen. And this is a Fairly typical oak pollen again here with three uh, slits um, in them and uh, very characteristic of oak. And oak is a very nice tree. Uh, and then mulberry. Um, mulberry, most mulberry trees are really small. This is just a really big example of a mulberry tree. And they produce, again, mulberry fruit here and a small diporate. Uh, pollen. It's, it's uh, fairly characteristic and they produce lots and lots of them. In other words, each one of these fruit has got hundreds of individual uh, little uh, cells on it and each one of those cells had to be pollinated. So those are great for shade in your yard but not over your deck. Right. <laughs> over your deck they make a terrible mess. Yes, they do make a really big mess. And, and this is sorrel. Uh, sorrel is actually uh, I call porate. In other words, there's a, a slit here, but there's also a pore in the slit. And sorrel or dock uh, grows as a, a weed around here. You see it early in the spring with the big leaves. Uh, they actually are edible. You can make sorrel salad. Uh, 
it's uh, you know it's a fairly strong taste, but it's it's not bad. You should, those should be color pictures because the top is a yellow color. It's, it's very characteristic. Well, yeah, the the top it hadn't quite gotten to that stage yet. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that uh, this is this is early in the growth. Later on, uh, the top will actually, you're right, turn yellow, and then eventually a very rust, strong rust-colored brown. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it, it's very characteristic. But yeah, this is early in the in the growth stage. Uh, and grasses, we have several different grasses. We are in the plains, and so this is grassland. Grasses are monoporate. They will have a single pore in them. And so they will all be fairly circular, granular in the middle, and these granules in the middle are actually uh, storage or starch uh, for energy storage. And then they will have a single pore on them. And there are pictures in the literature of a grass pollen where the granules in the middle are actually leaking out of the pore and spreading all over the place. And so you can you can think, you know, we think of, of the allergic function of these things being the intact pollen, but actually it doesn't have to be the intact pollen. This can fall apart and the individual starch granules in the middle here, which are very much smaller, smaller than a sink, you know, smaller than one micron, can get out in the air and get airborne and penetrate into the lungs. And so these are, you know, some examples. I think this is a, a Johnson grass and this is a uh, fescue and this I believe is a Timothy. And so we have many different kinds of grass in our area. <coughs> Plantain, uh, you see this all over your yard. You see this uh, lance type structure growing. If you mow your grass, these things can come back the very next day. And so you, you, know, you mow your grass and the next day you've got these lance structures sticking up. Uh, they have multiple pores on the pollen and generally they will have fewer than 15 pores. And so we'll see uh, uh, the kenopods have pores, many multiple pores, but they will generally have more than 16 pores. And so this is the uh, typical English plantain. And then this is the uh, domestic American plantain, which doesn't really make the lance structure and has a broader leaf. But these things can grow in marginal environments wonderfully. You'll see them growing on, on dirt roads in the middle of the road. Right. Uh, they can really, they're really good at marginal environments. So they can produce a lot of pollen. Uh, ragweed. We here in Missouri are probably the ragweed capital of the world, although we have exported to Europe and, and other places around the world. Uh, there are uh, farms here in Missouri that actually grow ragweed commercially for pollen extracts. And so you can see that they're, they're basically uh, this pollen has got the nice, sharp, spiky points on it. It's nice and rugged. Uh, it's produced either by, uh, we have two major uh, species, the short ragweed, which has the very fine filigreed leaf, and the giant ragweed, which has the much rougher leaf. Uh, the giant rag, and, they're, and they're, they're identified by the leaf, but also the giant ragweed tends to grow at least six feet tall, and, and I have seen these things eight and nine feet tall. Um, whereas the short ragweed tends to grow, uh, I mean, you know, it can grow four or five feet tall, but Mostly it tends to grow, you know, it can grow as short as one inch. So it can grow short enough so it gets underneath your lawnmower blade and, uh, and you don't cut it off and it pollinates down there too. <coughs> and so uh, it tends to be very hardy. Uh, our ragweed season is almost divided into two parts and the, the giant ragweed tends to go first and the short ragweed or common ragweed tends to go last. Hmm. Um, and it also, our ragweed season can last for two months, from the middle of August uh, through the middle of September into the middle of October. And we're just about through with ragweed season now, but lots and lots of people are ragweed allergic. Mm -hmm. uh, kenopod is a big family, kenopod, amaranth. Lots of the weeds named things are part of this family, uh, you know, like pigweed, ironweed, duckweed, gooseweed things like that. Kenopod actually stands for goose, is the old Roman term for goose foot. Uh, and it looks like this leaf right here, if you, if you look at the bottom of it, it looks like a goose when he's swimming in the water. Uh, and then we, you know, the indoor sampling is mostly for spores. Um, there's some controversy about indoor sampling, and I'd like to make the point that, that indoor mold sampling needs to be hypothesis-driven 
you, you have to look at the house first. You have to evaluate the place. And if there's some point that you need to prove with sampling, then go ahead and do indoor fungal sampling. Uh, most of the time, the house, if the house is really in bad shape, it needs to be cleaned up. And then if, it would, if there's a confidence building uh, function, you can certainly do sampling afterwards to show that uh, there is no airborne mold in the house. But a lot of times, uh, things are so bad, you know, you, you see fungus growing in the house, it's unpleasant, it smells bad, it's ruining, it's eat, basically eating the building. And so the thing to do is, is not to get in there and take a bunch of samples that you know are going to be positive. You just clean up the building. So um, mold is a lay term for fungi. Okay. Uh, and we can do, sampling can be viable or non-viable. Uh, most of the time in the indoor environment, we want to know what people are breathing. And so we will do non-viable sampling to see uh, and then basically to demonstrate that there's enough spore material in the air to cause respiratory problems for an individual. Uh, you can do viable sampling and get culturable fungi. This is more important, say, in the hospital setting when you, you want to know uh, not only what the concentration of airborne spores will be, but you also want to know that there are no species there that are going to uh, grow in human beings. And so, uh, you really like to know, if, is, is this an aspergillus that might grow in a human being, or is this an alfamuria, which is probably not going to be a problem. It's not going to survive at 37 degrees, which most humans maintain. <clears throat> okay, and so we've talked about, we've seen the Allergenco device, and this is an aerosol, another competing type of cassette collector. Um, and these are commonly used to sample indoor uh, spores. Uh, these are some viable devices. These you can see produce a, a, a result that's got a spore attached to a glass surface of some kind, either a glass slide or a small glass uh, mounted material here that's covered with something so the spore will stick to it. And so I'm just going to take this back to the laboratory and maybe put some stain on it that might help me uh, you know, define the characters of the spore. But uh, basically, I'm just going to look, look at this under a microscope and count how many spores I see. Whereas for the viable collectors here, this is a viable collector, we pull air in the top. There are literally hundreds, 450, I think, small holes underneath this. And in this body down here, we mount a auger plate. And so spores are pulled through the top and go impacting into the auger plate. We'll put the cover on the plate, sit it under the counter for, uh, or sit it under, under the hood for a couple of days uh, so that it doesn't dry out, and uh, see how many colonies grow. And then we'll, by looking at the colonies uh, under the microscope if necessary, we can identify how many colonies grew and what they at least what the genus is. Uh, and sometimes, if it's a common thing, then we can go down to the, into the species level on the, on the, the uh, colonies that grow. But most of the time, ad times identification to the species level is really not necessary to what we want to do. And that this, these viable collectors come in several forms. This is one that actually rotates. And so the plate rotates under, the, under a slit that's in the collecting device here. And so you get... Uh, collection over time if you want, if you mark the plate. And some of them are made so that uh, they spin and impact the spores into a auger strip that's mounted in the circular device here. And so uh, this, you know, this can be carried around by hand easily and it, it collects no matter what orientation it's in. And these have actually been used in, uh, in some of the uh, uh, space uh, shuttle vehicles and things like that to uh, collect the air and, and see, see if there's anything up there that might be, uh, might be growing that we might be contaminating things with. And then the, uh, there are lots of several types of personal collectors and these are little things that you can you wear the pump on your belt and you have a small line going up to, uh, 
to your collar, and that's attached to a small uh, either cassette or uh, uh, multi-use, single-use or multi-use collector here. And so you can essentially put these right in the breathing zone. And these tend to be very uh, useful for uh, uh, industrial or uh, occupational allergy problems so that, uh, that you can actually you know, have someone who's, who's having occupational problems during the day or at some particular time of the day wear this and see what they're breathing at what particular time. Coming very stylish, aren't they? Yes. <laughs> Wearing the accessories when they go out for yeah. dinner. Um, so, you know, those are the collectors. The top ten spores in our area are Cladosporum, Ascospores, Basidiospores, Altineria, Smuts, Epicoccum, Pithomyces, Rusts, the Bipolaris, Threshularia, Helminthosporum, that all look pretty much the same and you can't tell the difference unless you can watch them sporulate, and Aspergillus and Penicillium. And we'll go down these kind of one at a time here. Uh, this is Platysporum. It's easily the most common thing in outdoor air and most of the time the most common thing in indoor air. They grow uh, as strings of mycelia and then basically when it's time to produce spores, the strings of mycelia just segment off uh, and so this would be a point where the strings of mycelia are actually divided into three different strings and it goes to produce spores. So you get one spore that's actually attached to the spore here that's fallen away and three more. And so it's, it's very characteristic of Cladosporum to find uh, at least two and very often three, uh, sometimes four attachment sites on here. So as you can see, this one right here was attached to this spore and this spore, and it's coming apart, so it will have two attachment sites on it. But this one will have one, two, three, four different attachment sites on it. So these things, spores, uh, can be characterized depending upon the attachment sites. And, and if they are attachment sites, they are, they have uh, either, they're either basidia spores or the sexual, the asexual stage of ascospores. So most of the named spores that we deal with in allergy are actually part of the ascomycetes or ascospores. You have a sexual stage and an asexual stage. The sexual stage produces in a form that's not readily identifiable for most of these. And so the sexual stage would just simply be a, a sort of nondescript uh, spore, whereas the asexual stage will reproduce in a uniform manner and will produce an identifiable spore. And so things like Cladosporum and Altineria and Stemphilium are all in the ascomycetes, but they are all asexual stage spores when we identify them. Whereas this is an ascospore right here, and you can see that, that you know, they're just kind of small, um, <coughs> fairly nondescript, and for the most part, uh, not readily identifiable. And so when we see these spores, we simply count them as ascospores or ascomycetes. Whereas if we see a cladosporum or uh, an alternaria, we will count this as one cladosporum spore. The convention is to count every spore as one, no matter what, how big it is. And so the big uh, alternarias count as one. The little bitty aspergillus or penicillium spores count as one also. Uh, this is a basidia spore. Basidia spores are mushrooms. Uh, you can see this has an attachment site and also has a germ pore in it. And so these are grown on a stalk and therefore since they're all clustered around a stalk they will all be a little asymmetric. And so if you draw a line through here one side will be a little bigger than the other side. Uh, Alternaria is one of our big allergens in the area here. Uh, it grows as a mycelia and then the mycelia bulge out here and produce this large spore. Uh, it's very common to produce them as a chain of spores, this being the most mature and this being the least mature. However, when they're found in the air, they're almost always found singly. And you'll notice this is a lot larger than the, uh, the Aspergillus or Penicillium spores or even the Cladosporum that we've seen before. Uh, smuts. Smuts are all plant pathogens, and so uh, generally, since we're in an agricultural area, during harvest time, you find a lot of smuts in the air, 
as well as rusts, and rusts we'll see uh, in just a minute. Smuts are generally darker, browner, whereas rusts are generally yellower. Uh, this is an epicoccum, again, a big spore that's produced from a growing mycelia. Um, and this is very characteristic because it's almost soccer ball type. Uh, it has segments in here that make it look like a, a soccer ball. Pithomyces <coughs> is another ascomycete. It's really common, also common in indoor air, and you can see that it has segments as opposed to the alternaria, which had a beak or a tail on it. This is kind of blunt on both ends. But you can see these things are, look a little alike. Uh, and rusts, which are normally larger, have a thick uh, outer surface and generally more highly colored, typically yellow. Uh, the bipolaris helminthosporum, very characteristic with these inclusions here. They can be one or five or six. They can be round or ovate. Uh, but this could be either a bipolaris, a dreschler, or a helminthosporum, uh, depending upon how they sporulate. The Aspergillus penicillium are much smaller. Uh, you can tell the difference between because the Aspergillus grows off of a structure that's almost like a, a rod here with a blunt end. And this is shaped the same as an Aspergillum, which is that instrument that you see when they uh, anoint popes. Uh, and this is used to sprinkle the holy water around. And so uh, uh, the Aspergillus grows off of this. And it was named, actually, for its likeness to this structure. Uh, and the little spores come off. So this is an individual spore of Aspergillus. And you can see that's probably 100 times smaller than a large alternaria spore. And yet it still gets a count of one if I see it. And then penicillium uh, grows in more finger-like structures. And whereas Aspergillus comes from the Aspergillum, penicillium comes from the word paintbrush. Uh, from the Latin, and so this grows is more of a, a hand-like structure so that the, you have a stalk here, fingers coming off the stalk, maybe even more fingers coming off of that, and then the spores growing right off of the end of the aspergillus. And so these are very much smaller spores, and so you can imagine that it's, it's a whole lot easier to get thousands of these spores in the air at any one time, and so they're Commonly, when we see an indoor problem that's got really, really high spore counts, it's an aspergillus problem or a penicillium problem. They grow very prolifically. Uh, and then this is an air collector that collects a liquid sample. And we can use this to when we want to do visual counts, but we can also use this for culture methods, and we can use this for enzyme immunoassay. And so if we do enzyme immunoassay for what's in the air versus visual counts for what's in the air, we tend to get slightly different uh, answers sometimes. And the top one, I think, is the spore counts in up to 800 for ragweed one season. And the bottom one is actually an air collection taken every day uh, at about 9 o'clock in the morning for the amount of ragweed that was out there, and so uh, ragweed allergen. And so you can see that sometimes we can have high spore counts, but not a lot of allergen in the air. But if we do have a lot of allergen in the air, we almost always have a high spore count. Yes. And so that's sort of the, the overview of collectors. It actually is quite a science. Uh, a lot of it developed out of collecting uh, radioactive particles in the 1950s when we were getting uh, atmospheric testing of radioactive bombs. And so uh, a lot of the technology developed uh, for air collecting at that time. And so it's really interesting science. And there are, inst you know, there are uh, groups that study this. The Pan American Aerobiology Association is one that we belong to. And we also send our daily counts to the National Allergy Bureau, which is part of the American Academy for Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. So that's wow. a, a summary of pollen counting. And so it's counting. not a matter of going up to the roof and looking on a thermometer-like device and saying, oh, the pollen count is this. So people who call in and all think, oh, that's yeah. how you do it. That's how you do it. It's really a lot more yeah. involved. There, there actually, there's a German company that's manufacturing a device that collects stains and 
photographs and analyzes all of these things, but they're, I believe, quite expensive right now. And so it's a lot more practical to do this with a human. So that point. would be an automated pollen? Automated pollen, yep. And, and still you've got to have the human to maintain it, so. I guess so. Yeah. All right, any comments or questions before we close for today? All right, well, we're going to stop there. Thank you, Dr. Barnes, for this mm -hmm. presentation. Very interesting. So um, that's it for today. Um, uh, join us again on Monday for another conference online allergy. In the meantime, have a great weekend, everyone. Um, try not to get too um, many pollen grains into your nose during this weekend. It's almost over, so, as we've heard that allergy season is not done. Uh, so we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Yep, Rock, be careful. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences online allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to acaai.org. See you next time.